Mm. So two different terms. Mm. Is the dressing the one that you can wrap around, right? And the the other way around. Oh, no. Bandage is the one you wrap around. The, the dressing, dressing is, like is the what cloth. the dressing is what covers the wound. The yeah. bandage is what holds the dressing in place. So you might have heard doctors and nurses say we got to get this wound dressed and bandaged. They're meaning clean it off with some saline and rub out any any dirt and rocks and stuff. Put a dressing on it to stop the bleeding. Put a bandage around it to hold the dressing in place. Okay. So first things always what? PSI. 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 Let's say that he's got a laceration to the forehead. Got in, a, got in a car accident and he hit the windshield. So he's got a laceration to the forehead and it's bleeding. Okay. Now when you guys sign off on this, we don't want a patient assessment. Sir, how you doing? What's your name? What time is it? Whatever. Just show us the bandaging and splinting skill. We'll get into patient assessment when we sign off on that skill. All right. So BSI PP pen man, he's got a bleeding here that he's bleeding here in his forehead that I need to stop. So the first thing I'm going to do is make sure I got my gloves and goggles on. I'm going to hold direct pressure there. Okay, if he's conscious and he's following my commands, I might even ask him, sir, can you go ahead and take your hand and hold direct pressure onto that and press on it, okay? Direct pressure is going to stop it, from, stop it from bleeding. How does direct pressure stop it from bleeding? What's happening in the body? Clotting, clotting factors and the, and the platelets and everything are kicking in. Clot, clots are forming and it's stopping the bleed, okay? Now, if that blood comes through the dressing, do I pull that off and put a new one on? No. I don't do that, right? I just put a clean one on top of that one. Because if I pull off whatever's bloody, I'm going to start ripping off any clots that are forming and cause it to continue to bleed. All right? So take a look at it. And if it looks like the bleeding is controlled or near controlled, then get the dressing, which is going to be your curlex, and start coming around the head. Okay? And these, go ahead and move your hand, sir. These are stretchy and they're pliable for a reason. So when you pull them, you can keep tension on them and pull them tight. So when he lets go of that, I'm still pulling this tight and it's still keeping pressure on the dressing, okay? And I'm just going to come around that. If I want to put more pressure because it's still bleeding through, go ahead and twist it, okay? And then pull it. Is it coming off oh. his head because of his hair? I got to be good. Because of his glasses in the way there too. Okay? Now, if people have a lot of hair like that and you see it slipping on the hair, you want to put some more pressure on the back side, then go ahead and twist it in the back also and pull it around the back. That way it's putting more pressure on the, the forehead and the occipital region and pulling them together and keeping tension on the dressing. Okay? Twist it as you come around and just wrap it in place. If you have to, because girls have real long hair and you want to come up underneath the chin and go that way around the head this way, you can do that also. Okay? But if you do it tight enough, you won't have to do that. And once you get it all wrapped out, just go ahead and tape it in place. If you don't have tape, because they're like, oh my gosh, I forgot to bring the tape out of the ambulance, just go ahead and rip this and come the opposite direction and tie it. Okay? And then you can do it that way. That's why it's made to be ripped like that. Okay? Go ahead and tie it. Now, I know it, in your bandaging and splinting scale, it says to do a pulse motor sensory cap refill on extremities, all right? Before you bandage, before and after you dress and bandage. Because we want to make sure that we got perfusion through that extremity or through that wound. And then after we put the dressing and the bandage on, we want to make sure we didn't put it on too tight and we still have perfusion through that wound. We'll do that on the extremities. Pulse motor sensory cap refill if you have a broken arm or broken ankle. If it's on his forehead, I can still do PMSEs here, but I'm not going to feel for a pulse or whatever. I can just look at the color of his skin. If he's got pink skin, he's got perfusion through there, right? If he can feel what I'm touching, he's got sensation. He can, if he can move his eyebrows up and down, his motor function, his central nervous system is working and his, and, his mo and his muscles are working. Okay, so you can do it that way if you want. But primarily PMSC is, is for extremities. So his forehead is dressed and bandaged. Okay, now let's go ahead and splint his wrist. Let's say he also fractured his wrist and he's got a closed fracture of the wrist. So it's swollen right here. He's got some crepitus. I'm going to feel the pulse. There's a weak pulse. Sir, can you feel what finger I'm touching? No, those are numb. Maybe I've got some delayed cap refill through there because it's swollen, okay? But I do still feel a pulse, so I know I still have perfusion through there, all right? So what I'm going to do is choose a cardboard splint. Now, we got different size cardboard splints. We've got, one for, we've got smaller ones for the wrist. We've got bigger ones for the arms. We've got even bigger ones in the, in the room over there for the legs, okay? Because if he doesn't have a femur fracture, and he's got fractures to the upper and lower legs, and I need to use a cardboard splint and not a, and not a traction splint, okay? But for right now, we're just going to go ahead and splint his wrist, all right? Actually, let's say, let's say that his uh, whole arm is fractured. That way, we can show you how to use a whole, whole cardboard splint. Let's go ahead and say um, that, his, that his wrist is fractured and his, and his humerus is also fractured, 
Okay. So what I need to do is after I do my PMSC is I need to build my splint. Now if you have two crew members that are working together, while one crew member is doing the assessment, the other crew member can be building the splint. Okay. So all you're going to do is these are going to come in one piece. You're going to take your trauma shears out and you're going to go ahead and size it up next to the patient because you want to go above and below the injury site. So if this is his wrist that's fractured, I want to make sure I go past the joint and past his fingers and also above the joint. Okay. I don't want to go past his elbow because if I go past his elbow, he can't bend his arm and he walks around like this with his splint on, right? And he's got a wing sticking out there. So when he goes to step in the back of the ambulance or whatever, he hits it against the door, he does more damage. You want to make this into an L shape, okay? So go ahead and size it to make sure I come past the fingertips. And I'm going to go ahead and size it right there. So I'm going to go ahead and just, with my trauma shears, I'm just going to go ahead and cut a hinge into my cardboard. And then I'm just going to go ahead and put the cardboard together. So I can bend it like that. I can bend it like that. See how I'm making that L? Mm -hmm. Okay. Go ahead and give me that. There's a roll of tape down there. It should be laying on the floor. And then just go ahead and tape it together. Okay. Started that one already. Take it there. Just come all the way around it. Hold that hinge together, right? So tape it that way, and then also tape it this way too, coming through the bottom. It's really old tape. Right, so go ahead and build your splint. Now put as many pieces of tape on there that you need to. That's obviously, probably needs more than two pieces, but for time's sake, I'm just not going to put a whole bunch of tape on there. I'm just going to keep going. Now before we put the splint onto his arm, I want to pad the splint. So get some bulky dressings. Just give me some, uh, some uh, bulky dressings. Now that's not bulky. Give me that one right there. Get some bulky dressings, um, whatever you got in the ambulance you can use for patient comfort and to also stop the extremity from moving around once it gets inside the splint. So go ahead and pad the splint, all right? I can go ahead and bring it up to his elbow and just mold it around his elbow like that. Okay, just go ahead and sit your elbow in there, all right? Now you see that on purpose, I made that too short, okay? Because his fingertips are out past the end. If he can move his fingertips, is that immobilized? No. It's not because he can still move the bones that are inside as long as his fingertips can still move. So if you sized it too short and you see it's like that, just go ahead and get another cardboard splint. Okay. Go ahead and bend that. Set it right there. Inside of it. And I've, just and I've just elongated the splint, okay? And we'll go ahead and tape it up that way. The tape is really old. It's not holding it together really well. So once it's on like this and it's molded in place to his arm, all i got to do is whoosh, tape it in place there, tape it in place there, tape it in place there, and we're good to go. And after it's taped in place, what's the last thing I'm doing? His, his pulse motor sensory cap refill again, okay? So that's how you're going to splint. That's how you're going to splint that's how you're gonna splint an arm, just like that, okay? So I want you guys to put the whole splint on once we get in the classroom and uh, put the tape everywhere you need to, to tape it so it doesn't fall apart. Okay, I'm just going through it real quick right now so you get the idea of bandaging and splinting. And we'll practice it more in the skills lab. All right? I want to take this out of the way so we can, I can show you a different splinting technique. Okay. Now you're going to do the same if it's a fractured ankle. But if it's a fractured ankle, all you're going to do is instead of putting it in this position, you're going to make a boot for the foot and you're going to put it in this position so that way his foot's going to sit right in it that way okay but it's the same premise okay all right sling and swap your triangular bandages will come in a package like this in the ambulance all right 
when you pull them out of the package, they're called triangular bandages because they're shaped like a triangle, right? So what are we going to use the sling, the sling and the swath for? They're both triangular bandages. I'm going to put the sling on just to hold the arm to stop it from superior and inferior moving. And I'm going to put the swath on, which is pretty much just another, another triangular bandage that wrap around the body to stop anterior posterior movement, to stop this movement, to stop this movement, to fully immobilize that shoulder. Okay? So we'll, we'll use the sling and swath for, number one, maybe just to hold someone's fractured arm that's got a cardboard splint on like he just had, just so he's got a cradle to, to hold it in on the way to the hospital. Or if it's a fractured clavicle or a dislocated shoulder, you can also use the sling and swath. Okay? Because what's going to happen if this if a shoulder gets lo dislocated? It's going to pop out of the joint, right? And it's going to pull on those tendons and muscles, and that's what's going to cause a lot of pain. So if you've ever dislocated your shoulder, you're going to roll up on scene. You're going to see the patient self-splinting and holding it up like this. Because as soon as they let it drop out of the joint, that causes a lot of pain. They're going to push it back up like that. Okay? One of the main rules for bandaging and splinting is always splint in the position found. Okay? Don't try to move it. Splint in the position found. There's only one time we could try to move an extremity into a different shape or into a different position. When is that? When you guys think that is? When you have no pulse. When I don't have pulse. If I've lost pulse and I've lost perfusion, I can try to, I can try to uh, manipulate an extremity fracture one time to see if I get pulses back. So let's say his wrist is fractured and I'm doing my initial PMSCs and I don't have pulses. Then I'll go ahead and try to strength, I'll try to go ahead and uh, put it in an anatomical position, position and put it in a straight line and see if I get pulses back. Move it one time and let the patient know what you're going to do because it's going to hurt. If I don't get pulses back, I don't continue to man manipulate it, move it around. I try to move it one time. If I get pulses back, great. If I don't, just go ahead and splint it in the position found. Okay? So if it's his shoulder and he's self-splinting already, we need to immobilize it. We need to stop it from moving up and down. We need to stop it from moving backwards and forwards. Okay? So there's a couple ways we can do that with these triangular bandages. One of the ways Dr. Millette likes to show you guys that's real quick and it's really fast, the way the military does it, is he just grabs it like this, he doesn't even make a, a triangular uh, cradle, a hammock out of it. He'll just go ahead and wrap it around the arm, like this. Give me some room real quick here. Just wrap it around the arm this way, wrap it around the arm that way, okay? And then I'll take the two ends, and he comes around the back. And he ties it like that real tight, and it's splinted, okay? So that's one quick way to do it. You'll also see in the field where we'll go ahead and open it all the way up so it's a triangle. Pick the shortest corner of the triangle and, and make a nice big fat knot in it. Okay, make a nice big fat knot in it like that. Because what I'm doing is I'm pretty much creating a hammock for the arm to fit in. I'm putting a cradle for the arm to fit in. Okay. So if I'm going to do that and he's already self-splinting, all i got to do is mold the splint around him. So I'm going to go ahead and put the knot at the back of his arm back here. Okay, stick that there. And usually this takes an assistant because you've got two or three people working at the same time instead of me walking all the way around the patient and trying to manipulate his arm. Um, can you come over here this way and grab this part, bring it up through his arm there. Okay, and make sure that you're you're getting all the slack out that way, okay? So this one's going to come up, this one's going to come over here, this one's going to come around the back and make sure that we're getting all the slack out that way, okay? So if you're going to do this, you pretty much got to kind of manipulate it to get the slack out to where it's holding his arm. You, want it, you don't want there to be a lot of slack and have it be real loose like that, okay? So go ahead and pull some more slack through this way. Hold the knot in place. Pull some more slack through. Is it coming through? Okay. That's about as tight as you're going to get it. All right, so it's nice and tight, and then all i got to do right here in the back is to go ahead and tie a square knot in the back to tie it off. But before I tie, I tie it nice and tight, it's going to hurt the back of his neck if I put a knot going right into his spine right there, right? So give me a, a, a Curlex or any kind of bandage you want to use for padding and stick it against the back of his neck, and then just tie a knot across the padding so it doesn't hurt his neck. Okay, so that stopped pretty much the inferior 
and the, the inferior and, and, um, superior. and superior movement of his shoulder, right? But he can still move it backwards and forwards, anterior and posterior, so it's not completely immobilized yet. So what I'm going to do is get a second sling and swath, or a second triangular bandage, excuse me, and make a swath out of it. All i got to do with that is just go ahead and just wrap it up and just come straight around the patient this way. So come up underneath his arm there. If you want to even come up under his arm, up underneath his wrist to make sure it holds his whole arm there, do that. Just come around the back, and then we just tie a square knot back here, and now he's got a sling and a swath that's in place and it's on. Okay? So the first thing we did before we put any of this on was PMSC. When I get it bandaged and splinted and it's in place, I'm going to do a PMSC again, pulse motor sensory cap refill, to make sure it's not too tight. Okay? So that's the sling and the swath. That's the curlex and the 4x4s, and I showed you guys also a little bit about the... Um, cardboard splints for, for fractures, okay? There's all kinds of different ways to splint and bandage. It doesn't have to be pretty. All we're trying to do is immobilize the fractured site so we don't cause further injury on the way to the hospital. Because as soon as you get to the hospital, the doctor is going to cut all that stuff off anyway so they can x-ray it and take a look at it and, and reset the fracture if they need to or do surgery or whatever they have to do and go from there, all right? So if you can immobilize it and you can stop bleeding, get them to the hospital, you've done your job as an EMT, all right? This takes some practice. We'll work with this stuff in the skills lab, and we'll sign off on our uh, traction splints today. All right? Okay. The only thing I didn't have is the only thing I didn't say is the eye. Can okay, I tell so about the donut real quick? Oh. There's one right there. One more thing. If somebody's got an eye that's popping out, it's all fun and games when someone loses an eye, right? <laughs> There's a way that we can immobilize the eye. Okay? What you're going to do is get a, get a piece of Curlex. You're going to make a little donut out of it like that. Because what that does is that puts pressure on the eye orbit. It doesn't put pressure on the eye itself, and it holds the eye in place. Okay. So it could be a lacerated lid. It could be the whole eyeball popped out. It could be a scratch, a laceration right across the eyeball. We want to save that eye if okay. we can. So you kind of like. Okay. So you're just going to put it if his if his eyeball is bleeding or avulsed or it's kind of hanging out. I'm just going to make a donut out of this. And all we got to do to make a donut is take a, is take a curlex like this. All you're going to do is take the Curlex, and you're just going to make a loop in the Curlex, like this. And with the other end, you're just going to keep on feeding it through that loop. Feeding it through, feeding it through, feeding it through, and the end product is that. Okay? Okay, so, so the other way that they've decided is also using a paper cup or something like that. See, that would keep the pressure off also. So even if I didn't make the donut, but I had a cup available, I could, like, cut it off in half grab the eyeball, but even this, if I bandage it like that, it's going to prevent pressure on that eyeball. The only trick with this is that you have to wrap both the eyes. Remember? And you already talked about that. And either the donut or the cup helps because what if it's an impaled object in the eye? What if they got a pencil stuck in the eye? I can still come over the top of the pencil and immobilize, right. and the, an immobilize the impaled object and still put pressure on the, on the eye orbit that way. Just use your common sense okay. and make your... Um, equipment work for you. You can use your scissors, you can cut the cardboard, you can cut the tape, you can do every, whatever you want. What are we going to hold this in place with? Uh, the bandage. There's some Curlex coming around, just like we did for his head. And then you'll use his ears for anchors, that kind of thing, but make sure he can hear and breathe and his mouth is open. Yeah. You said cover his other eye so that he's not looking around to move. Right, because he'll move yeah. and can Yeah, because your eyes will move in unison. So if you cover one eye, and he's still looking around with this eye at stuff. This other eye is going to be moving around up, up, the up underneath the bandage. This eye is still going to move in also. So he's going to lose his sight. You're going to have to tell him. We're going to have to cover both sides, sir. You're not going to be able to see. But always keep your hand on him if he's going to walk. Keep your hand on him and walk him towards the ambulance. Or bring the gurney over to him and guide him as he sits. Because the last thing you need to do is have a patient falling on you and then suing you. I remember, all he, can, all he can do is hear, breathe, and talk now that both his eyes are covered. So you have to be concerned about that, that he lost one of his senses because you covered it up. So just pay attention to that. Okay. This is the list. I found it in um, someone's book over here. I'll put it right back. But this is the list of things you're responsible to know on the bleeding control and the splinting and injuries right here. I've also found um, a couple more tubs to set up stations so not everyone's up here just trying to get everything out of this tub. You can make about four um, practice stations around the room while this is going on. So have this list out, you guys, and kind of go down the list and make sure you're, you've got the general idea about all these different skills, okay? And Mr. White will be in here. You can ask him anything to come and help you. Check your splints, check your bandaging to make sure that it is adequate. I need to see the equipment officers and the lab 